Are you concerned that you're not covered by insurance should you need long-term care? Does the topic of Medicaid send shivers down your spine? Do you fear having to spend down all your assets in order to qualify for Medicaid and not being able to have anything to pass on to your children and grandchildren? If so, then this is the video that you need to watch. For today, we're going to discuss the when, the where, and the how. Medicaid planning fits into your long-term care needs and how to assure a benefit to your children after your passing. Be sure to subscribe to our channel, like our videos, and ring the bell. By doing so, you'll help our channel to grow so that we can reach those who need help in order to better protect, grow, and ultimately distribute their net worth. Our guest today is Jackie Cara of Cara Law. Jackie provides custom and individualized estate planning and elder care services ranging from the creation of wills all the way through to Medicaid planning and eligibility. With her years of experience in Medicaid planning, eligibility advice, guidance, and filing of applications, Jackie is in the position to share with us what we need to know in order to relax those knots we're feeling for either our parents or for ourselves when it comes to Medicaid and long-term care. Welcome, Jackie. Now, Jackie, let's start with the most important question on our viewers' minds. If they need to go into a nursing home and they don't have long-term care coverage, will Medicaid take away their home? Thanks, Pat, for having me today. Most folks I speak to have heard the same rumor. Um, in fact, many of my clients come to me specifically because they're afraid that they're afraid that if they need home care or nursing home care due to illness, that all of their assets will be used up paying for care and they won't be able to leave anything to their children or grandchildren. The short answer is this rumor is just not true. Um, Medicaid for nursing home or home care services does not take anything from you. Instead, what happens is when you apply for long-term care benefits from Medicaid, they look at your assets and decline you coverage if you have too many. Medicaid does not actually take anything away from you. Well, that's a good point. So let's look at this from another perspective. What if the individual or individual's parent is not eligible because they do indeed have too many assets? Do they have to go through all their assets before they can qualify for Medicaid? Not necessarily. Which assets are available for purposes of Medicaid eligibility depends on several factors, and it changes depending on your personal circumstances. For example, a married couple owns a home together and it is indeed their largest asset. The wife has been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. They would like to plan for needing long-term care when her condition worsens. Their home is an unavailable asset if the couple lives in the home. So if that same wife needs home care services, Medicaid will not consider the house in this scenario. It is unavailable when she applies for Medicaid for long-term home care services. It is also unavailable should she need nursing home care because her husband still lives in the house. What is available when we apply for Medicaid is different from what we might consider to be our assets. That's a very good point and certainly not one that naturally comes to mind. 
when considering Medicaid. Now let's talk about the elephant in the room. Suppose an individual couple never did any planning and now they're afraid that they won't have anything left to leave their children and grandchildren after they die. Oh, Pat, there are so many options available to folks. And I meet so many people in exactly this situation. They never did any planning before. And it's something I deal with fixing every day. While it's certainly not ideal, a qualified elder law or estate planning attorney like myself can put plans in place to preserve or reduce your assets and protect certain assets from the cost of care. Things like gifting, promissory notes, transferring assets to qualified trusts, and prepaying for funeral arrangements are all strategies that can help you become eligible for Medicaid services. Great. That is really good to know. But today we're living in an age where the individual prefers to do things themselves and not involve a professional. I'm sure that you hear that ab Medicaid applications seem easy to fill out. Why would a person not want to do this themselves and save themselves the legal fee? That's a great question, Pat. Applications for Medicaid seem very straightforward and are read readily available on the internet. I mean, how hard could it be to answer personal questions like name, address, phone number, and things of that nature? However, knowing how to properly answer questions and what information to attach to your application can be challenging and may make the difference between qualifying and not qualifying. It's important not to be penny wise and pound foolish when dealing with your assets. For example, many people do not have a good understanding of which assets to report. Remember we were talking about available and unavailable earlier? Well, as a layperson who hasn't filed hundreds of applications, you may think your house were available when it's not. And that could cost you big time when applying for Medicaid. Um, many people don't have a good understanding what to report or how things need to be reported. And you may not know the ways in which a couple can lower the amount they have to contribute towards their care. In other words, what you don't know can and will hurt you. That is a great answer. Now, here's another question that I'm sure you've been asked before. What is the difference between Medicare and Medicaid? when it comes to providing nursing home care? So this is a frequently asked question for sure. Medicare is for people over 65 and may cover the first 100 days of care. I'm sure you've all heard about the 100 days of care. Provided the person's care meets certain conditions. And those are conditions like, do they need skilled nursing care? Are they able to take care of their own activities of daily living? Things like that. Medicaid is based on an individual's financial ability on the date of the application, and if qualified, will cover the person's care following that first 100 days. In other words, most people need both to pay for their care. Aha. Now, a natural follow-up question is, at what age should a person start doing their Medicaid planning? Well, first, it makes sense for most people to understand how Medicaid works in general and whether they're appropriate for planning. So there's no specific age when you should start asking. I can tell you that most people come in to discuss Medicaid planning when they're in their 50s and 60s, and that's a good time to ask the question. If you're engaged in lifetime planning and you've started working with an estate planning attorney earlier, say in your 30s, when you went through so many life milestones, like had your first child, bought your first house, gotten married, things like that, um, that can begin much earlier and it can be done in baby steps. So the answer is 50s or 60s is a good time to ask the question if you haven't asked them in your 30s and 40s. Okay. Well, clearly we have an answer for what age to start to consider Medicare planning 
But how does one know if Medicaid planning is appropriate to their situation? For people for whom Medicaid planning is appropriate, they've already started to think about that. But there are a lot of factors that come into play. First, we need a really good understanding of your assets and how you hold those assets. Most people don't have a good understanding of what Medicaid counts when they add up their assets. Resources like IRAs that you count as part of your assets may not be considered as available assets for Medicaid under certain conditions. Many discover that they are closer to eligibility than they think. Second, we talk about your plans for the future, your personal sensitivities about assets. Some people really like to keep a lot of money on hand and others are more comfortable being aggressive about protecting assets. So say you and your wife own that house. Um, it's your family home. You have no plans to move. You have no need for that value of the house in the future. You have plenty of retirement savings set aside. This makes your house the perfect asset to protect in an irrevocable Medicaid approved trust, which then makes the house untouchable when it comes to Medicaid planning. That's usually a strategy I start my clients off with when we begin planning. That is interesting. Now let's throw in a real life scenario. Let's say that between the husband and the wife, they have a high monthly income from their retirement plans. Can they still qualify for Medicaid? Yes, they might be able to. There are strategies that can be used to protect monthly income while still qualifying for Medicaid. A qualified estate planning attorney can help you with those strategies. You may use things like a pooled trust, which allows you to pay certain bills with your income while making that money unavailable for Medicaid eligibility. Income is one of the two things that Medicaid looks at when they're considering your application. Income and assets. A comprehensive strategy that works on both your income and your assets will be necessary when applying for long-term care. Can you help us out here? Just what is a pooled trust and how does that work? Sure, that's an excellent question. A pooled trust is an irrevocable trust designed to protect income from Medicaid eligibility assessment while still allowing your bills to be paid from the trust. Think of it this way. You would like to be able to have Medicaid benefits, but your income is too high. Remember, Medicaid looks at your income and your assets separately. You're allowed to set up a pooled trust or an irrevocable pooled trust, deposit part of your income into it, and direct that the trust administrator pays certain bills for you out of the trust. Once that part of your income is sent to the pooled trust, that income, when Medicaid looks at it, is no longer part of the asset qualifications for your Medicaid eligibility. That sounds great. Now, are there any downsides to a pooled trust? Well, I always say to people, there's no free lunch. Um, any of these strategies that we're using to sort of protect your assets and keep them away from eligibility problems um, comes with a cost. So there are pros and cons. As I said before, a pooled trust is an irrevocable trust. And it can be the difference between eligibility and saving thousands a month in out-of-pocket expenses and ineligibility, which may cost you thousands of dollars in monthly expenses. So things to consider when you're talking about a pooled trust are the administrative costs. Um, a pooled trust is not free. It comes with setup costs and administrative costs, and those administrative costs are based upon how much you put into the trust every month. Um, pooled trusts are also irrevocable, which means at the end of your life, your family does not inherit what you've put in. The money remains in the pool, hence the name, to benefit others. Now, Jackie, you mentioned when it comes to pooled trust that there are administrative costs. Let's dig a little deeper into this because at the same time, our people are worried about spending down their assets. To do Medicaid planning is has to have a cost. So what kind of costs should our 
investors be looking at in order to get good Medicaid planning? So that's a great question, Pat, and it comes up all the time. Uh, a lot of people are afraid of consulting with an attorney because they've heard nightmare scenarios about cost overruns and hourly billing. And, you know, they are looking at spending money out of their pocket and that can seem scary. What I encourage my clients to do is look at the benefit. So if, for example, an attorney is charging you $3,500 for some piece of estate planning work, um, but the attorney is able in giving you that $3,500 worth of service to protect your half a million dollar house, you understand the value of that work, right? The cost benefit analysis is clear. For a lot of people, the idea of working with an attorney can be intimidating. One of the things I pride myself on is making the job not intimidating to people. I want my clients to understand what their costs are going to be very upfront, what they can expect from my office in terms of services delivered, and exactly what we're going to work towards protecting and saving them in the long run with the proper planning. Now, I often say that planning comes in steps. You know, a great estate plan is a lifetime plan, and it evolves as you go through life's milestones. So what you start when you're going off to college at, 20, at 22, 23, what you increase when you turn 30 and you go through all those next level milestones and what you do in your 40s and then your 50s, it changes over time. So if we properly grow an estate plan over time, we can do these things in baby steps to keep the legal expenses manageable and keep the benefit to you growing. So I always like to encourage my clients to actually look at what they're saving by engaging in proper planning, whether it's for Medicaid or for a special needs child or whether it's for elder care planning for an adult, uh, for a parent. All of those things come with a direct cost benefit to the client. Well, Jackie, we happen to have a viewer question that came up on this very topic. Fred D. from Albany asks, I'm looking into Medicaid planning and keep hearing words like eligibility and availability. What's the difference? What exactly do they mean? You're right, Fred. Medicaid planning is complicated. So let me try to break it down because you're right. Eligibility and availability are the key words we're working with here. Each year, Medicaid states what the eligibility requirements are to receive Medicaid services. We expect that each year those requirements will go up, taking into consideration cost of living and inflation increases. So for example, let's say that this year, Medicaid says that to qualify for Medicaid benefits, an individual must have less than $1,000 per month. And these aren't the real numbers, I'm just using them to make the math a little bit easier. And they have to have less than 20,000 in available assets. You see how that works? You have to have both the right income and the right assets to qualify. So to be eligible, the applicant must have below $1,000 in available income and $20,000 in available assets. The word available is very important. Eligibility simply means that a person can obtain the benefits they need because their available income and assets are below the stated level. But ownership of assets doesn't always mean that those assets are available. For example, Fred, you and your wife own a home. One of you needs home care services and you'd like to obtain benefits to pay for the care. But you think you're over the asset level because you own a home worth $50,000. In this case, that's not true. Your home is an exempt asset, meaning it is unavailable when you apply for Medicaid. Now, if you have a viewer question, we would very much like to hear from you. Have your pencil ready because here's how you get the question to us.